All right, we're continuing to talk about manipulation. And I asked you to do an assignment and look for five or six Bible characters, specifically in the Old Testament, that demonstrated manipulation. Now, before we go ahead and do that, let's have a word of prayer. And then at the end of this session, excuse me, session, I need to give you some information on Linda Higgins. So make sure one of you remind me to do that, okay? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the unique opportunity once again to gather together to study your word. Thank you as we are reminded that you do not leave us to our own understanding. And as we acknowledge these things, you will direct our pathway. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement this morning about your faithfulness and looking for the small divine interventions that you bring into our lives. I ask that you would give clarity and understanding tonight as we continue to talk about this uh, sinful practice that many people have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we want to take a look at Bible characters. And I gave you a list, so I'm not even going to ask you if you came up with any, because all you have to do is take a look at your list that I gave you as far as the notes are concerned. So the first one is Adam and Eve. And manipulation is part and parcel of the sin nature. Now, before Adam and Eve, willfully chose to rebel against God's perfect order, they would never have manipulated each other or tried to manipulate God because they were perfect. When the fall happened because of their sin, and man got plunged into the Adamic nature, the sin nature, that is part and parcel of the sin nature. It's not that a person has to be taught how to manipulate. Um, they might have to be taught how to not how to avoid getting caught or to refine the skills of being a manipulator, but it's part and parcel of the sin nature. We're born with it. Manipulation, as I said, is as old as the Garden of Eden, and it started with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, Eve wanted to be like God and to know good from evil. Satan's lure to know good from evil was based on experiencing good from evil. When God said for them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God was saying, you need to look to me for the standard of good and evil. You don't need to experience evil to know it's evil. You have to believe what I tell you, that if something is evil, it's evil. Well, she chose not to do that. She listened to the message of the serpent, and she gave to her husband, and they both ate. And then manipulation began to take place. Um, this manipulation ruined a harmonious, perfect relationship that they had with their creator. Now, when Adam and Eve were exposed, each tried to manipulate the other to avoid punishment. Adam attempted really to manipulate God, if you look at the text correctly, by claiming that if God had not made Eve, he, Adam, would not be in this predicament. So he is trying to blame God for the creation of a woman. Eve tried to play, uh, blame God by pointing to the serpent as the cause. 
if you are the creator God of everything, then why did you create the serpent that you knew was going to come and tempt me? Then, of course, when you get down to the servant and you have this uh, interrogation take place, uh, suddenly he could not talk any longer. He had locked jaw. And when confronted, he had nothing to say. Manipulators, when they are involved in trying to get out of a sin and its consequences, listen to me, manipulators who try to get out of the consequences of a sinful decision, they're going to blame. In that situation, manipulation and blame are two sides of the same coin. Now, as I go along, if you have any questions, turn your mic on and interrupt me, okay? The next is Rachel and Lee. Uh, interruption. Okay, go ahead. Interruption. What? Um, so the Adam and Eve thing, um, so I guess because Satan isn't a person that that uh, what he did with Eve, it wasn't manipulation on behalf of Satan. Is that the way we're to view that? Well, no, no, I think, Carl, you have a valid point. He did manipulate Eve to accomplish his own goal, which was to live out vicariously him wanting to be God. Remember, he got kicked out of heaven because of his five assertions. And so if I can't get it myself, let me live it through vicariously through God's human creation. Therefore, I can I can be God because I've caused them, I've influenced them to switch sides, if you please. So yeah, I can see Satan being a manipulator with Eve and certainly with his initial statement that he made to Eve and then it's flat out denial, you surely will not die. So that's a good observation, Carl. Anybody else? Oh, Rachel and Leah then. This is in Genesis 30, verse 14 and 15. Now, you remember that God blessed the physical union between Jacob and Leah. And immediately, my memory serves me right, she had at least four sons right off the bat and Rachel was getting really upset that she could not conceive and in fact she even went to her husband and demanded that he give her a child a son in particular and his retort was to the point who am I am I God to give you a son Being a woman who was barren without a child was culturally viewed as God's punishment for some sin in the woman's life. To bear a child that was not a son was okay, but the height of glory to a woman was the birth of a son. <laughs> Now, back in their culture, they thought that mandrakes, some type of a fruit, had a um, uh, Aphrodite uh, uh, enhancement to the fruit. And so if you ate it, you would get pregnant. And so she bribed Leah, Rachel bribed Leah with sleeping with Jacob if Leah gave her a bushel of mandrakes. So again, if you keep the concept of manipulation in, in mind and, and its uh, definition and characteristics, who is the benefit here for? Well, it was for Rachel. And then you got Jacob and Esau, and this is in Genesis 25, verse 29 to 34. Jacob plays off Esau's hunger. Now, let me back up for a minute, okay? 
it was not Jacob and Leah. It was uh, Isaac. No, I'm getting confused myself. Uh, no, it was it was uh, it was Jacob. He's the one that fled and then came back with uh, the two wives. Okay. Uh, now, if I'm out of air, somebody correct me. Uh, but with Jacob and Esau in Genesis 25, Jacob plays off of Esau's hunger to usurp. God's foreordained program in making the older Esau serve the younger Jacob. Now, did mom and dad know this? Did Isaac and Rebekah know God's program for the twins that were inside of her womb? And the answer is yes, they both knew. But the mother, Rebecca, was not willing to wait on God to bring about his program in righteousness. So she steps in, orchestrates this trickery that would take place to where when Esau is out getting his dad's favorite meal, she persuades Jacob to disguise himself, she cooks up a savory dish, and he goes in and serves it, and his father specifically says, are you my son Esau? And he lies and says, yes, I am. God had already promised that <laughs> Esau would serve the younger. Yeah, Esau would serve the younger. Esau would serve Jacob. God already ordained that before either boy was born. But Rebecca, for some reason, wanted to get ahead of God's program in case, for some reason, uh, man would interfere with it. Well, she caused 20 years of lost time in Jacob's relationship with his father because he had to flee. So Jacob manipulates Esau. Esau comes in from the field, remember? And he's hungry. And Jacob, he was an old homebody. And he's in the kitchen cooking up a mess of stew. And Esau smells it and says, oh, man, that is great. Can I have some? And what does Jacob do? I give you some of my porridge, my stew. You give me your birthright. That's manipulation. Jacob already had the birthright, if you please, if he would have allowed God to bring it about, but he didn't. Now, I find it also very interesting here, the spiritual nature of Esau. He was a godless, immoral man, according to the book of Hebrews, and he didn't care about his birthright as firstborn. Jacob manipulates him. And then you have Ahab and Jezebel. We didn't get this far on the morning service because it wasn't a part of the message. But you remember that Ahab saw a piece of land just outside of his window. And he knew who the land belonged to. And he contacted this person and was willing to go ahead and purchase the land. But the gentleman who owned the land could not sell it because it was a part of the gift that God had given, and he could not sell his inheritance without disobeying God. And so Ahab gets all upset. Jezebel comes in from getting her nails done, I don't know, and here she sees Ahab in the bedroom, and he's got his face pointed to the wall. And he's got this poochy lip on. His countenance has fallen. Jezebel says, what's the matter with you? Well, I talked to so-and-so, and he wouldn't sell me his land. And uh, this is so unfair. Jezebel says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. So Jezebel manipulates some scoundrels 
to make a false accusation against, I think it's Nathan is the man's name. It's not Nabal. Uh, and the man made a false accusation and it wound up getting him killed, stoned to death, and the land was available and Ahab got it. Again, who benefited from the situation? And then you have Delilah and Samson. You don't hear much about some of these judges, these personalities in the book of Judges. That would be an interesting uh, study. He, Delilah was a very um, uh, gorgeous woman, evidently. Uh, you have to realize that what you remember about Samson is his strength, right? And if you examine his life carefully, he was quite the riddle maker. He would come up with riddles to try to entrap and, uh, those who were against him. But one thing that a lot of people don't focus in on Brother Samson is that he was a womanizer. He was a womanizer. He couldn't keep his cotton-picking hands off of beautiful women. You remember the first time you run across this problem in his life? is he came home and told mom and dad he wanted this foreign girl to be his wife. So Delilah will be used by the Philistines to try to find out Samson's strength. And she'll put on her feminine charms to lure Samson into telling her what his great strength is. Now he stalls her at least once or twice and uh, of course she uh, feigned the, the female, poor me, and shed the tears. And eventually he did confess what his strength was. And you know the rest of the story. Now this one here, Brother Joshua is a really fabulous man of faith, but he has two black eyes from the book of Joshua. Godly man, love the Lord, but he made two fatal mistakes in his leadership. The first mistake that he made, you find in Joshua, I believe it's chapter six, when they went to battle at Ai. They had just got done with Jericho. Massive, massive victory. And so here they were going to approach Ai. Now, on your own, you might want to take a look at a map, a Bible map, of the conquest and read your scriptures and check off where these cities were. There was a central campaign, a northern campaign, and a southern campaign. And God is so wise that he directed Joshua to take out Jericho because that was in the middle of the inheritance that God was going to give to the Jews. And it was a fortified city where all the other cities were not fortified city. So if this city collapsed and the other cities surrounding it saw that, the victory would be almost assured. So there's great victory at Jericho and on to Ai. Well, some of the men came to him and said, oh, don't make all the men labor. It's a small town. We can take it. Well, you know the story. They got they got whooped, didn't they? Well, the problem was God told Joshua and Moses in the book of Deuteronomy how to lay siege to the cities in the inheritance land. And Joshua did not do that. One of the specifics was every man of war went to war. Every man who was of age to go to war went to war. That was his first mistake, and it cost him. He made a commitment to protect the Gibeonites that continued all the way through, I believe, the days of Solomon, who finally had to take care of matters. The second mistake that Joshua makes is when the Gibeonites here came to him pretending they were from a far away country. I think this is Joshua eight or nine. 
And the reason they did that is because they wanted to avoid being a city under siege, but they did not realize that God said, only within the promised land is this program to capturing cities that are a part of the inheritance I'm going to give you. And they were outside of that, but they didn't know that. So they come to Joshua and they pretend to have come from a long ways. Their clothes are all tattered. Their bread is all moldy. It looks like they had been on a very long journey to seek Joshua out. Now, the problem with this here is Joshua and the elders did not consult with the Lord about what to do. And they enter into this contract. So the Gibeonites deceived Joshua and the elders as they created a false circumstance of where they really came from, according to Joshua chapter 9. And then you got the Philistines and Delilah. This is the manipulation of Delilah. The Philistine rulers enticed Delilah with silver into deceiving Samson to find out what his unusual strength was. 1 Samuel 16, verse 5. And then you have Nabal and David. Nabal promised David that at the annual shearing time, David and his men would get a portion of the produce, the shearing, whatever it was, from his flocks, as long as he protected them and protected the men who shepherd the flocks for Nabal. They had this agreement. It's not recorded in the scriptures, but they had this agreement. It is evident they did. It is also evident the character of Nabal, if you read in 1 Samuel, that he was, his name means fool, but he had a reputation of a uh, evil, wicked man that couldn't be trusted. His word was, was no good. He would make promises and break them. So Nabal manipulated David into protecting his men and his possessions with a false promise that David would get something at the annual shearing time. Then you have Saul and Michael. Michael is Saul's daughter, by the way. Saul uses Michael's affection for David as a snare to rid himself of his quote-unquote enemy. This is in 1 Samuel 18, 20 through 21, and chapter 19, verse 17. Remember, some of the inner guard told David that Saul really likes you, and he's willing to give one of his daughters in marriage. And so Saul thought to himself, this is a way that I can get rid of him without being accused of shedding blood my hand, by my own hands. And so he tells David, you need to go out and get 100 foreskins, and then you can marry my daughter. Well, David, being an overachiever, went out and got 200. And so he comes back, and uh, Saul wants Michael to deceive David, wants to betray him. And when she finds out that Saul is going to send people into their house to kill David, she warns David so he could flee, and then she makes up the bed as if there's a body in there, and she puts an idol up near the top by the pillow and covers it with goat hair as if there's a person sleeping. Now, that, that raises a whole set of questions like, why is David putting up with idols in his house? Very similar to Jacob putting up with idols uh, that his wife stole from her father and was sitting on top of the uh, uh, camel and could not get down because it was her time. So Saul's hoping that Michael would betray David and he could get rid of his enemy. 
Then you have Nebuchadnezzar, the chief steward, and Daniel. Now remember in Daniel chapter 1, he's been taken into captivity. And the king wants these choice young men to be educated in the Babylonian ways, including dietary matters. Daniel was a vegetarian, and he evidently knew the Levitical code. And so when the chief steward came to him with the filet mignon and the double stuffed potatoes and the asparagus covered in cheddar cheese sauce and sour cream and bacon bits, Daniel said, I can't be eating that. Carl, I see you smiling. I can't be eating that. And uh, he, he refused to go ahead and eat it. And the chief steward was very, very concerned. And he says, look, if you don't eat these things, my head is on the line. Now, Daniel gives us principles on how to appeal to an ungodly authority. And Daniel proposes a plan. And at the end of it, he demonstrates he and his three friends look better than those who were on the diet, the rich diet that was served to the king. And then you got Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel's three friends. Remember in Daniel chapter five or six it is, Nebuchadnezzar sets up a gold statue of himself. And when they hear the music, everybody was supposed to fall down and worship this statue. Now, Daniel's around, but evidently he was not written in to the scriptures of this point. So I don't know where he was or what was going on, but his three friends were the three friends that were originally part of chapter one and the three friends that were in chapter three that got thrown into the fiery furnace. So here it is. Fall down and worship. And they refused to do that. And the king became incensed. And he made, he, he, he threatened them, please fall down. I don't want to throw you in to the furnace. There was a relationship that Daniel and his three friends had cultivated with all three world emperors. emperors. And so Nebuchadnezzar tries to manipulate Daniel's three friends by just pleading with them just fall down. I, If you don't, I've got to throw you into the fiery furnace. And last week we talked about the different ways people can use to manipulate. And then finally, you have the Pharisees. The Pharisees who instructed certain wealthy worshipers that if they took what they had set aside to care for their parents and gave it to the temple, they would be exempt from the law's requirements, Matthew 15, verse 3 through 6. So to make their positions more secure, to demonstrate how, um, what's the word, how powerful they were over people's lives by receiving this money into the temple. They manipulated these Jewish worshipers who had an obligation to set aside, <coughs> excuse me, a portion to care for their aging parents. But in Matthew 15, there's this dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees, and they make this proclamation. Well, if we set it aside, then, you know, this is this is good. It's 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 a higher principle than taking care of our parents, and of course, Jesus rebuts that with scriptures from the Old Testament. Now, we need to take a look at a midway point here. There's some statements up on the screen there. Manipulation is about advancing self by using others. In all of these cases, Manipulation is about advancing myself or protecting myself by using others. 
manipulation robs God of his full and rightful glory. <coughs> manipulation sets God aside along with his program to accomplish my program. Bible says don't rob God of his glory. Manipulators do that. Manipulation uses the basic levels of sinful communication, verbal, nonverbal, and written. You've been tracking on Tuesday, we've talked about ways that we communicate verbally, nonverbally, which means the way you look, and then written. So manipulators have these three tools in the communication field to use to manipulate other people to get what they want. And then finally, manipulators often use other people to get what they want. That's obviously, tragically, the person, this is important, the person being used as the middle agent does not recognize the process, the goal, or the outcome. Let me see if I can give you a pretend case study. One of my children come to me and they say, Dad, I really need your help. Oh, what's up? Well, I wish you would go talk to our youngest sibling because he really needs to do this and he refuses to listen to me. Could you just go talk to him? That's manipulation. That's manipulation. Well, why? Because I'm going to talk to this son based on what my daughter told me, supposedly, what my son was doing. I'm in the middle. And if he understands scripture, if there is a problem between two people, the person who has been offended is obligated to go to the offender and try to work out the situation. A lot of times, parents don't realize that they're the middle person in manipulation. I don't know how it is up here, but in the Midwest, and Ms. Davis, I'm, I'm sure you will verify this, we had number of number of cases where there was a rash of young couples getting married, not anticipating the birth of a child. They had escalated their lifestyle to living on two incomes, and now this child comes along but they both need to continue to work. They both have car payments. They both have insurance on the cars. They have a house that is only manageable with two incomes. They have a lifestyle that is exceeding their income of one person. They're living on two incomes. Well, who's going to get shortchanged? The child is going to get shortchanged. So here's how the manipulation goes. One of them, more than likely the wife, will go to her parents and say, could you really help us out for a little bit? Uh, I need to keep working. Uh, I think in six months, it'll be okay for me to retire and uh, uh, raise the child. Could you just help us out for six months? Is there anything wrong with that? What's wrong with that picture if there is anything wrong with it? Why wouldn't a parent want to help their, their daughter out, their child out, their son-in-law out? Well, if you look at how they got into the situation, you might want to reconsider helping them out. It wasn't like suddenly they were inundated with enormous health bills that their insurance wouldn't cover or some tragedy that took place financially and caused them to stumble and fall down and be overwhelmed, they were making choices all along. 
And so they manipulate parents. Can you just help out? Can you just help out? In the times that I have been involved with this, six months turned into years. Turned into years. And during that process, in some of the cases that I've dealt with, there has been marital discord. And there's been a separation and or a divorce. And now the mother is a single mother having to work downsize. But her income coming in basically takes care of the rent and the basics. She can't afford child care. What do you do? These are real things. And I think many times we can get in the middle of a situation and not realize that whether intentionally or unintentionally, we are being manipulated and trying to lend aid and help in and of itself is not wrong. It is wrong if you don't get all of the data about how they got into that situation and then you decide to help them, now you're becoming an enabler. It's a word from psychology, but it means to help them continue to live in a sinful way. That's what it means. Now, so far we have studied some very, very important things. What I would like you to try to do next week, and that's going to be a wrap-up session, I want you to think about what major counseling points should I address. Pretend you're a counselor and you've got a clear case of manipulation. Have you gone through all of this material with the person? What are some things, and I'll, I'll give you a clue now, there's three of them. What are three things, major counseling points that you should stress to a manipulator? Don't think about a specific situation. Just think about the concept of manipulation. What are three things that we need to biblically address? We've identified it. We've illustrated it. Don't want to kick a dead horse. What are some things that we can rebuild a foundation in that person's life. All right. Thoughts from great readers.